everyone. Uh, I'm Dr. Lester Heroy from Philippine Society of Public Health Physicians, and we're very happy to bring you uh, part two of the three-part webinar series for palliative care. Um, this second part, or part two, is focused on palliative hospice and bereavement care for COVID-19 and other patients uh, facing life-threatening illnesses in hospitals. So this, uh, uh, this uh, document, this guidance document, is actually designed for uh, level, level one and two hospitals especially where we do not have palliative care specialists. And uh, as we do the discussions later, we will understand better why and how important these uh, guidance documents are. So we welcome all our participants. We have uh, many, of, many of them are also our residents of family medicine. We have many participants who are from different parts of the country. Uh, Rizwan Visayas Mindanao. We have uh, colleagues from Department of Health, especially regional offices, uh, regional hospitals, um, and uh, even um, colleagues from uh, NGOs uh, and the academe. And uh, yeah, and uh, most likely we will be uh, getting more participants as we move further. So, um, uh, as many already know, and especially for those who have already attended the first, uh, the part one, which happened last Friday, um, uh, PSHPM, along with Philippine Society of Public Health Physicians and Hospice Philippines and the Ruth Foundation, uh, are preparing palliative care guidelines. Uh, and that's three parts. Now, the first part is for communities. Uh, the second part, which is the focus for today, is on uh, for, for hospitals facing life-threatening illnesses. So this is a way, in a way, interconnected part one and part two, community and then hospital. Uh, part three is a bit special because it's uh, on triage decisions, shared decision making, and advanced care planning. Um, as we go along, we will understand actually better why these are important. Although I'm sure by now we have heard stories of patients dying really, you know, because of COVID and uh, the impact on families, especially with, you know, changes in uh, travel restrictions. We cannot visit, you know, our patients um, and uh, new arrangements for, for funeral. Um, actually, this is the third of the webinars because the first one we actually did in April 6. And uh, so we, we do more discussions uh, on this. Um, the second, the part two guidelines, which is basically the coverage of this webinar, um, is really focused on the hospital, uh, especially level one, level two, in provinces where we do not have palliative care specialists. Uh, most of the content and discussion is, you know, how do we optimize provision of palliative care? And uh, what does it mean? What, how unique uh, the management of severe and refractory phase, the dying process, and uh, immediately after death, what happens, and also bereavement support. Um, we will also tackle a lot of things on legal, social, spiritual, religious aspects, and even funeral arrangements. So it's a bit uh, unique, and uh, this is a very important section. Uh, discussion, especially as uh, COVID is still there, and uh, the content is all is not only uh, relevant for COVID patients and families who are affected, but also even for non-COVID because uh, we still have patients who um, suffer like heart attacks, uh, MI, and, uh, and cancers, and so on. And we still hear a lot of stories of these. There are even patients who are because of limitations in, in the surge capacity, even with, you know, um, pregnancy, cesarean section normal, they, you know, suffer and they go into end of life, which is really sad. Um, and uh, the, the, the discussion, we might, uh, be, th there might be a bit sharing of experiences and uh, best practices as well. So Philippine Society of Public Health Physicians is very happy to work with our colleagues from Hospice Philippines, from PSHPM, the Ruth Foundation, and hospitals in coming up with these. And uh, we also want to inform everyone that the, there is a Facebook um, 
group palliative care collab where where all these are accessible it's it will also be accessible all these documents are will be accessible as well in pshpm and pshp uh, facebook um, and we will be working closely with a bigger group of uh, specialists and physicians who are looking at all the guidelines with along with doh looking at all the guidelines and making sure they are consistent and unified as a matter of fact uh, yesterday i think the guidelines for um for how to assess and algorithms for the return of workers to work uh was was published uh by by pct doh and i think this mid group and uh we also supported that so uh, all these guidelines, we are, we are making sure that these are uh, interconnected and can really help our societies as we move uh, from MECQ to, to GCQ and uh, to the next phases of COVID response. So I end here and I'm going to turn over uh, the discussion to Dr. Uh, May Corbera, who is the Executive Director of the Ruth Foundation. She will be the moderator. She will uh, give uh, a bit more introduction and we'll also introduce the speakers and then we will we are privileged with to hear the three speakers. Thank you and over to you, Dr. May. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Lester. And good afternoon, everyone. Um, so I will serve as your moderator this afternoon and this late afternoon. And um, I have um, the privilege of introducing our um, distinguished speakers for this afternoon who all three are very well based in the hospital setting, in the tertiary hospital setting, and also in uh, training programs as well. So for this afternoon, our first speaker uh, will be Dr. Lisa Manalo, who will go through um, uh, the talk on symptom control and advanced care planning within the context of this guidance uh, document, the second guidance document. So Dr. Manalo, um, is the head of the section of supportive oncology and palliative care at the Augusto P. Sarmiento Cancer Institute of the Medical City, um, and also is a faculty of the Department of Community and Family Medicine of FEU. Um, she is also one of our founding members in the Philippine Society of Hospice and Palliative Medicine. So to be followed by Dr. Manalo, our second speaker is once again, Dr. Agnes Vausa, and she will um, focus in on the talk regarding end of life care, grief, and bereavement. And Dr. Bausa is presently uh, a consultant at the JB Lingad Memorial Regional Hospital, among Rodriguez Memorial Medical Center, and also at the Medical City, Cardinal Santos Medical C Center, and FEU NRMF. Um, he, she's also a clinical associate professor of the UP College of Medicine, Philippine General Hospital under the Department of Family and Community Medicine, and also the medical director of Active Care Home Health Solutions. And finally, to be followed by Dr. Bausa, our third speaker is Dr. Joey Hoson, and she will talk now, uh, she will talk about integrative approach, the psychosocial approach, and spiritual approach, including the legal aspects of care in the hospital context. So Dr. Hoson also finished her residency in family and community medicine um, and her fellowship in supportive palliative and hospice care at UPPGH um, is also a graduated from master's in business ad in health from the Ateneo Graduate School of Business. And she's our treasurer in the Philippine Society of Hospice and Palliative Medicine. And now she presently heads the Integrative Palliative and Home Care Unit um, Palliative Research Cancer Center at the Makati Medical Center. Dr. Bausa, you ready? Let me upload first my uh, screen. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Lisa, while waiting. Okay, go ahead. There we go. Okay, okay. so I'm going to discuss about the end of life care, specifically during the last few days of life of the patient. What do we do after the death? And a, a little about bereavement care. Okay. So, uh, as we all know, most of you will be at the first level and second level hospital. So, I I really have to search. Sino sino ba yung mga primary, yung first level and the secondary level. So I would know how to approach this topic because end of life care 
in training is a very difficult topic and uh, it will not take 20 minutes to discuss. Okay, so um, I, I would just like to emphasize uh, that uh, in a patient in the hospital, no, the, the doctors and as well as the nurse, they work hand in hand and make rounds with the patient and do the initial evaluation and symptom assessment. And these symptoms have to be communicated with the team. So the team are all the doctors that is involved in the care of the patient, including the social worker, including the, the manong, no? everyone uh, attending to the patient are the team. So there should be collaboration between these people and that is what we call teamwork. No? So everything should be discussed and every one should be at the same level of understanding of what is the direction of care of the patient, the advanced directives uh, that was already discussed with the family and what is now uh, the aim of the management. No? So we have to consider the inputs of all uh, members of the team to make it a uh, palliative care approach. So the father of uh, palliative care, no, C. Twy Cross, no, uh, he reiterates that we as doctors are not legally and ethically obliged to preserve life at all costs and prolong the dying process if we see that patient is really dying. No? And despite of all the things that we do, uh, everything is irreversible. All the medications given, despite of that, there is no improvement uh, in the, in the um, prognosis of the patient. So the priorities would change from cure to comfort. No? And there are management or treatments that is given to acutely ill patients that may no longer be given to a dying patient. So we have to go back every day, every now and then to the patient and reassess. So if we lose sight of the aim of management during the last days of life of the patient, the goal, no? so we will be uh, making unnecessary decisions like um, ordering laboratory examinations, no? even if the patient is close to death. Um, an example of this will be ordering a lot of um, frequent ordering of ABG because of the dyspnea, uh, frequent ordering of uh, electrolytes, no? and even x-rays. So if uh, we see that patient is really uh, going no? near the end of life, the last few days of life, there's no need to do all these laboratory examinations and they are said to be inappropriate anymore, okay? So identify who, who among the multi-professional team of the patient to, to discuss or disclose that patient is nearing the end of life, no? You have to identify sino ba sa, sa team ang pinakamalapit sa pasyente, ang pinaka na handle yung pasyente at kilala yung pasyente. Kilala in such a way that the, the, the member of the team has worked with the patient and was able to discuss uh, some personal issues and preferences with the patient. So preferably, uh, the member of the team that has the com competence and confidence and have a good rapport of the patient. No? So we also have to uh, provide psychosocial support and spiritual support to the patient and also the, to the family, which Dr. Hosson will discuss also later. We as doctors should always think of these four principles, the cardinal principles. First is the autonomy. We respect the patient's wishes and preferences. No? Beneficence, we will not do uh, uh, we will do good to the patient no? rather than doing harm or prolonging the agony. Uh, third is non-maleficence. We minimize the harm by weighing uh, the giving of medications, no? the benefits versus the harm. No? And of course, be fair in the use of available resources and that is justice in palliative care. Okay. 
So in preparation for the death of the patient, we have to recognize is this patient really is dying. So there are general indicators to be able to determine if patient has a poor prognosis, number one of, of which is poor performance status. No? We use a Karnofsky a scoring or ECOG scale no? to determine the poor performance status of the patient. So if there's impaired nutrition, no? uh, lack of appetite, weight loss, no? and even um, patient is not able to swallow. And of course, this is the, the common uh, question that we ask uh, for doctors no? in, in the training. What is the level of the albumin? Because every week the albumin goes down no? if the patient is terminally ill. And other clinical predictors will be high WBC, low lymphocyte percentage count, and of course, persistence of uh, the symptoms and progressive, no? uh, the dyspnea, anorexia, no? restlessness, agitation, all of this. And of course, we consider the biomarkers, no? progressive increase in uh, creatinine, ammonia, no? and even liver enzymes, no? and uh, uh, the presence of comorbidities. Okay. In palliative care, we use the following um, predictive um, index for prognosis. Now you can search on them, palliative prognostic index, the PAP score, palliative prognostic score, or prognosis in palliative care studies, or the PIPs. Okay, so just a sample, uh, palliative prognostic index uh, uses uh, the usual uh, predictive uh, factors, um, performance scale, oral intake, edema, dyspnea, delirium. No? And this determines if the patient will survive more than six weeks or less than three weeks. Okay, the palliative prognostic score also uh, uses the same uh, factors to determine the prognosis of the patient. No? And it determines if patient uh, survival for 30 days. Okay, so now in preparing for death, to be able to recognize, no, the common things that we ask are the following. What have you observed? No? Is patient profoundly weak, bed bound, drowsy, disoriented, not interested to eat anymore, and having it difficult to swallow even the medications even food and water no and of course most of the patients that we see 99 percent of them um ha already have a connection to the other side the relatives have already gone ahead uh sometimes they talk with these uh loved ones no this is not usually found in the book but if we talk with patients in real life, no, in our practice, we always um, see uh, this, no, uh, commonly communicates with the dead loved ones. Okay, so of course, preparing for the death, recognition, what are the signs and symptoms? Usually, alam nyo naman ito, no, metal skin, um, yeah, yeah, noisy secretions, yung paghinga, nagiging mas labored, no which kailangan i-increase ang opioids, no? um, what else? Uh, increasing fatigue, social withdrawal, no? hindi na nakikipag-usap, and tahimik na lang. Okay, now as we said, no, we have to be clear with the goals. We have uh, to make the patient comfortable for the last 24 hours, make the end of life peaceful and dignified, Always coordinate with the family what's going on, what are the medications being given to assure them that patient is being taken care of 24-7. And of course, make the memory of the dying uh, process meaningful. How? Since uh, most of our patients are in isolation, we can make use of the cell phones, laptops, no? video calls, no? uh, prayer or vigil through the phone. And of course, um, as healthcare professionals, the doctors and the nurses also have a big part on this, on how to make the dying process meaningful. Okay, so when we are with the patient, it's important to talk to the relatives, no? Uh, what else? 
support the family, talk to them what are the plans. No? Uh, most commonly na hindi na discuss is about cremation. No? But here now in the, in the setting of pandemic, there's no more question about that. Of course, if COVID positive, all patients has to go uh, to have cremation. Okay? So investigations, as I've said, since our aim is comfort, we don't need to do any repeated blood extractions because it added uh, pain to the patient. No? Okay, so these are the challenges in the terminal phase. Progressive functional decline, root of medication, uh, food and fluid intake, and compromised oral intake. Okay, so since our uh, aim is to make the patient comfortable, do we still do cardiac resuscitation? All of these things, artificial respiration, IV infusion, expensive enteral and parenteral feeding, NGT and antibiotic. This is always the source of debate no? in practice if there is no advanced directives that was uh, previously discussed. No? These things will prolong the dying process of the patient. It will also add to the agony of the patient and will, will not give any additional benefit to the patient because these are given to acutely ill patients wherein uh, there's a greater chance for recovery. So in a dying patient, these are not given anymore. Okay? Now, MGT may have a benefit for patients who have no, um, who have uh, difficulty, who, whom we have difficulty in, in putting IV line. If patient is edematous, then we can use the NGT for the medications. Okay, now what we do uh, in practice no, for breathlessness or labored breathing, no, or difficulty of breathing, if there's already an existing opioids, no, we count the respiratory rate and adjust the dose of the morphine. No? Um, usually, the dose for this nya is higher than what is needed for pain. So if a patient is already on 10 milligrams of oral morphine per NGT, then you just increase it by 50% or even uh, make it uh, 20 no? if the RR is really uh, high, no? then you observe, then after 15 to 20 minutes, you reassess and give additional dose by 5 milligrams no? orally or per NGT. Or if it's IV, you give 2 milligrams every 15 minutes until a comfortable breathing is achieved. Okay, now artificial nutrition or hydration in uh, end of life care. Um, commonly an issue with the family. No? They don't want to see patients uh, without an IV line or even without the, uh, the TPN because for them, giving this nutrition means giving love. No? But uh, for patients who are dying, they do not eat anymore because they are no longer hungry. Okay? So we, we don't want to stuck a lot of food in, the, food in their throat, no? and it will only cause aspiration pneumonia, uh, giving added uh, problem, no? and increasing secretions and this. Yeah. Okay, so um, what we have to do is uh, explain carefully to the family what, uh, the, what is the status of the patient now, and that uh, giving the, all this nutritional support will not give benefit and will not prolong the life of the patient. So they are more comfortable at a slightly dehydrated state and without all this uh, expensive nutritional support. No? Now, why do we want the patient on a slightly dehydrated state? Because these patients are already having circulatory failure no? and their uh, veins are collapsing. Um, um, they're prone for congestion if you give a lot of hydration. Now, if there's urine output, uh, less urine output, it's actually beneficial because there's uh, less need for urinal, uh, less need for turning the patient, for changing the, the diaper, no? 
and uh, you don't need to catheterize the patient if there's a, a decrease during output. And if less um, hydration, no, there are less pulmonary secretions, thereby there's no need to do frequent suctioning. So this is, uh, the nurses are happy with this, no? Kasi hindi sila magsasuction more uh, frequently, okay? There will be less GI secretion, so yung mga patients na um, may intestinal obstructions or even uh, bloated, no? Uh, if there are less uh, um, IV, then they're more comfortable, okay? With less IV, there will be less edema, less ascites, because usually they, they have low albumin causing uh, edema. So patient will be more comfortable. Now, one of the common uh, procedure that we do in palliative care, since the patient's hand or arm or even foot are already very edematous, is this subcutaneous injection, which I feel everyone should know. Because even in the hospital, when we give order to the nurses to insert a subcutaneous injection, they don't know how to do it. But it's just a simple procedure that uh, very much um, um, important no? to be able to give all this medication. So um, if there is no available uh, oral route no? or even IV route, subcutaneous uh, line can be inserted so that the medications for end-of-life care can be given. Okay, so subcutaneous injections, no? uh, we give 1 to 2 ml of the medications. No? We cannot give more than 2 ml because it cannot be absorbed anymore by the fats. So subcutaneous means fats. Okay, so these are commonly used in patients who, are not, who cannot uh, tolerate oral medicine, especially those who are dying with nausea and vomiting, no? and those with problem with absorption in the GI. Okay, so this is, these are the advantages. No? Uh, you do not do frequent insertion because it's in the fats. No? You don't need to hit a vein because it's the fat. No? And um, you can give a lot of medications uh, which is, um, can be given through the subcutaneous line, all those medications for end-of-life care, okay? So, ang disadvantage naman is if there's an inflammation in the infusion site because kung hindi makontrol yung drip, no? And of course, the leakage, especially in elderly wherein the skin has poor elasticity, okay? Um, allergic reaction is rare, Okay, so what do we need for subcutaneous injection? We just need a gauge 24 subcutane, um, uh, IV cannula, an alcohol, cotton with alcohol, occlusive dressing like uh, tegaderm or micropore tape and non-sterile gloves. Okay, so these are the common sites that we use in uh, end-of-life care, no? Although um, I have to emphasize we do this not just in end-of-life care. Even in home care, if um, we see a patient who, who is in distress, we insert a subcutaneous line if we cannot do an IV line. Okay? So the anterior abdominal wall, anterior aspect of the arm, this one. No? Anterior abdominal wall here, there's fat there. Okay? The abdomen here and below the navel, the thigh, and this one at the back of, um, uh, of our arm, yung loose skin and fats, no? yung lumalaylay. So yan ang ginagamit natin, commonly used in palliative care. We insert a subcutaneous line there. So how do we do it? We pinch the skin, the loose skin, no? uh, without including the muscle, and we inject or insert the, the IV cannula 45 degrees angle para kang kumukuha ng blood dito sa, sa arm. No? So that's the angle. So, so that uh, the, the IV cannula uh, needle will be in place. No? Then after you remove 
the needle of the ivy cannula and put a uh, what do you call this? You hepla. Okay. So in this picture, you see no that uh, the IV, uh, I mean the subcutaneous line, no, the site can be seen. No, so we could see any redness or edema in this site. If there's redness and edema, then there's time. Uh, that's the time you change it, no? And you go to the other arm, and root, after a while you rotate, no? It doesn't have to be on the same arm. Okay, so these are the the sites that you should not insert a subcutaneous line, no? Tumor site, breast tissue, in the abdomen if there's ascites, if in the arm if there's edema, no? And of course in sites near the joints or uh, bony prominences, okay? So this one, you see there's a redness. So there's, that's the time you, or even before, no? Na maging ganito, you have to change the site to another uh, area as we have discussed. Okay, so when do we change the subcutaneous line? We change... Uh, the recommendation is change every seven to ten days, no? But uh, I have some patients two weeks uh, maayos pa, so we still give the medications. But if more than that, we have to change, no? Because the elasticity of the skin, no, uh, in elderly is poor, so there will be leakages in of the medication in the outside of the skin. Okay. Of course, it would help if there's a catheter, as we have mentioned, especially in patients who are, who are on MECVENT, no? Uh, it will be easier for the, uh, for the carer, no? For the uh, healthcare workers and also for the patient, no? More comfortable if there's a polycatheter. But we have to consider the advanced directives of the patient because most of the patient would indicate in their advanced directives if they want tubes to be inserted or not. Okay, so during the end of life, we should review the routes of administration and the medicines that is being given. So the most essential medicines are the following, analgesics, anti-emetic uh, anti sedatives, and anxiolytics. No? So you have to consider stopping other medications. No? If patient is already having hypotension, so you don't need diuretics anymore. Patient is not eating, you don't need hypoglycemics. No? Okay, if patient is not eating, you consider stopping steroids also because it can cause GI bleeding. Okay? And remove or stop those that are not necessarily essential. Okay? So these are the suggested minimum sets of drugs for the end of life care wherein most of them are available in the Philippines. Okay, so opioids, anticholinergic as Dr. Manalo discussed, the HNBB, no? The HNBB, oh what happened? Antiemetics like haloperidol and metoclopramide, uh, tranquilizers such as midazolam and diazepam and antifungal, okay? Although this um, antifungal, kung kaya ilinisin ang bibig kasi it can also cause uh, discomfort to the patient. Now, the roots of administration all should be given except the one uh, encircled, no? It should not be given IM because if we give it every four hours intramuscular, then you are inflicting pain to the patient. No? So all of this can be given through IV and subcutaneous. Now for some reasons, like if there is no IV root, no subcutaneous root, then like the opioids, you can give it rectally. No? A tablet of opioids can be given rectally. It has the same bioavailability with the oral even if um, sustained release opioids can be given no? as long as it touches the rectal mucosa no? so that it will be absorbed. Huwag niyo pong ipapasok lang ng basta-basta at nakasiksik siya sa pupo ng patient. 
because the, the drug will not be absorbed. Okay, now this is a reflection while making this uh, PowerPoint, no? that we have a lot of sources of grief. No? For the patient who is admitted, Patient is having fear of dying, being alone, patient is lonely, anxious of what will happen with, with himself or herself. He or maybe angry to the situation, angry to himself, no? maybe having guilt of not being able to provide for the family no? and uh, the future of the family. Patient may having spiritual distress, what will happen and what is beyond. No, uh, the the relationship with God might be not good. That's why uh, it's the cause of spiritual distress. And of course, being admitted, patient cannot perform the usual activity that the patient does. And of course, they suffer financial loss. No, not being able to work. For the family, they might be feeling angry, or they might might also feeling guilty for not being there to hold the hands of the patient and to give support. They maybe have difficulty also on calling, no? Uh, and the communication, that's why they might be angry. Angry towards themselves or angry towards the healthcare workers, okay? Uh, guilty or angry because of not being able to bring their loved ones uh, immediately, okay? And the care and the management is late, no? They might be anxious of the future they, because of the, uh, of the uncertainties, okay? They might be also angry that uh, the best care for their loved one is not given in, in that specific hospital, okay? Lalo na, no? Yung may mga pin, uh, nagpasa-pasa, may mga nakikita tayo sa TV na ganyan, ganyan, okay? The family member may not also be able to perform well, no? Um, work at home uh, because of the the worry of the loved ones and because of the responsibilities of those remaining at home. And of course, they also have financial loss. For the healthcare workers, we also fear of dying. We have this, um, of course, we have colleagues who already died, you know, and we don't want to be one uh, having COVID also and die as well. No? So we have fear and we have paranoia that whenever we come back to our houses, we are the cause of infection uh, to our family members. So we are paranoid, especially for, for those family members where there is a uh, vulnerable uh, member, which are the children and the elderly. Okay? So we also are not able to give our best care because of the high work demand. No? Most, some of us are on quarantine, uh, nagro-rotate, no? and uh, because of the high work demand, we may not be able to perform well. Okay? We may not be able to give our best management. Why? Because maybe the medications are not available, the equipment is not there, and of course, the lack of manpower. And of course, the social stigma. Ito, pagod na pagod ka, pero paglabas mo, kinatatakutan ka ng kapitbahay. No? Because you might be the carrier of the coronavirus. We cannot also perform our activity well. Okay? Why? Because of the dissonance. No? So I have encountered this. The dissonance is disharmony between self. No? and our commitment. So it's a tension between our commitment to serve versus the responsibilities that we have at home. No? So financial loss, of course, is also a factor for the healthcare worker. So all of these are sources of grief no? for all of us, not just for the patient and for the family. Okay. Now, this is the suggestion, no? collective psychosocial resilience. So we have heard about resilience as a way of coping. No? So we have to balance everything, our responsibility to others, 
be aware of your uh, workplace. What are your responsibilities wearing PPE? Uh, uh, frequent hand washing, sanitizer, no? And of course, read a lot of information to be up to date and always coordinate with your infection control um, consultants, no? Responsibility to self. We have to regulate our emotions. We have to regulate our mind, you know. And of course, uh, they suggested this solution focus. What can we do at this time, next month, and the coming months, you know? And it will always help to talk with our colleagues and friends, you know, to give us strength, to give us uh, wisdom, and also to advise us, okay? And for our moral obligation, we should know our job description. We should talk to our higher um, leaders, you know, and be able to meet what is required of us. So there should be balance between the three. So this is what we call resilience. So easier than, uh, said than done, you no? Know? Okay. So what else can we do in a dying patient? Just talk to the patient if kaya pa, no? Kung hindi na sana before uh, tutulog-tulog ang patient, sana nakausap, no? Give assurance to the patient that he or she will be taken care of, no? And make the dying process peaceful and comfortable. And to the family, assure also the family that uh, everything will be done no and everything possible no if there's medications no taking care of the patient and of course uh, give psychological and emotional support and of course um spiritual uh, counseling also matters no it will help the family cope up with the dying uh, patient so this is my last slide thank you for listening I hope you have learned something. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Dr. Bausa. Okay, so we will uh, move on. But again, I just like to, um, you know, in encourage our our listeners to type in your questions. So, uh, Dr. Joey Hosson, for our last uh, the last part of our talk this evening. Okay, I'll just start to share my screen. Can you hear me? Yeah. Clara? Thank you. We can hear you, Joey. Thank you. So can you see my slides? Yes. Uh, so good evening, good everyone. Thank you. Go ahead. I'll be discussing the last parts of our uh, guidelines. So uh, bear with us. There's a few slides, no? So palliative care is a holistic approach. So the reason why we'd like to look into these aspects, so the legal and social support, spiritual and religious aspects, the funeral arrangements during COVID times. Um, my presentation would be focusing on some pearls. Um, they are institution based, and of course, I'd like I appreciate that you share yours along the way. And there are quite number of legal issues in terms of palliative care if advanced care planning has not been done. Like uh, um, Dr. Lisa Manalo's slides show that uh, ideally we want to have this in place, but in COVID times. Um, there's a bit of a challenge uh, for us specialists, even attending um, doctors to discuss those things. Okay, so um, for legal issues on palliative care, um, medical futility is uh, one of the controversies. Um, it arises when doctors send the patients. Of, of course, the family members also disagree about whether a particular treatment is inappropriate or inadvisable in a particular circumstance. So uncertainty about the appropriateness or benefit of interventions is a product of difference in perspectives. So on what constitutes benefit to patients and how individuals would vary dramatically in how they define value you know, as related to life. So while legal and moral acceptability of treatment limitations is well established, 
um, clarity in establishing goals of care. That's why we do advanced care planning. Timing of transition from cure to palliation and the importance of communication as what Dr. Rabaus uh, did step by step no, of specific discussions to withhold further aggressive interventions really remain a problematic uh, issue for both patients and clinicians, especially in this time of COVID. Um, everything seems to be an emergency, right? But when we, when we uh, look into our chronic patients and uh, ask their values, their preferences, uh, things change. So we'd like to prognosticate and let them know where we are and then the palliative care specialists come in to provide better communication around end of life issues because these are things that your attending doctors would not like to discuss. And then some conflicts of aggressiveness of care can be escalated to ethics committee once um, the decision of the medical team or the family and the patient are different. So, um, this um, institutional ethical guide during pandemic was done by Dr. Angel Stanalor in her institution. The very um, pearl that I'd want you to look at is the consideration, uh, the first consideration is about medical utility, you know, based on scientific criteria, you choose the action which is likely to produce the greatest good for the most number. So in this time of COVID, um, in my experience, I'm uh, you know, happy to say that I don't have, or the team doesn't have to decide whether to, uh, what you call this, to do, to who to put into the ICU or who to intubate because of limitation of uh, resources and manpower. I'm sure you have um, seen a lot of news from other countries that they have had this kind of, um, what you call this, um, Decision making, uh, what they call this capacity, where uh, it's uh, they're limited to to what they call they're limited to give the best for their patients due to this um, uh, pandemic. But now, more of our chronic patients, uh, in our experience, more of our chronic patients are needing of acute care, no, not only the COVID patients that are not accepted in the hospital. That's my experience. So this is uh, where we really want to maximize the referral to community and home care and palliative care, which, where we can give orders remotely and set up the home uh, for the care to be available there because the hospitals are all congested. And communication is key. And it's very important that we communicate them to our patients. Um, uh, that's the uh, challenge right now that we're facing. So in this guideline, that's what I want you to look into because um, what Dr. Manala have said that um, advanced directive is really important in our patients. But for COVID patients, um, those who are not chronically ill uh, will have some kind of uh, challenge in discussing uh, the advanced uh, advanced directives with them. So the availability of a skilled person or the, uh, what you call this, the uh, palliative care physician uh, is needed in this, uh, in the team for difficult questions to be discussed. Okay, so it's always the preference of the patient, whether they are chronically ill or uh, what you call this, or healthy, but when their preferences are heard or documented, then it uh, makes our lives easier to, to treat our patients, okay? So what else? What issues? It's about truth-telling. You know? So we know that every patient should be told if they have COVID positive. And the stigma is also hard, no? Parang if you're the one telling the patient, but it's their right to know. Okay, and there's also the patient confidentiality. The disclosure um, follows the communication, good communication about breaking the bad news. So the guidelines would be you deal first with the person's emotions. You listen, you prepare the person, you give the information in a kindly manner and with assurance of hope and continued care because not all 
COVID patients succumb to the illness, right? So there's always hope. And also, if a patient requests not to inform others to fear of discrimination or for whatever reason, uh, it's our job to explain why, diba? In a pandemic, both um, in the pandemic, public health concerns drive decisions or actions and physicians may have to violate the patient's individual right to privacy. So you should try to make the patient understand why the results uh, have to be disclosed and the patient should not accede to the patient's request. Okay. And um, since palliative is a holistic approach, we also would like to protect our frontliners. So when we try to screen our patients, we have, uh, we have questions regarding history of travel, history of exposure. Uh, in the Republic Act of uh, 11332, as seen in your screens, uh, it's very important to, uh, what you call this, to, uh, what you call this, to know the information and to disclose, diba? because it saves lives. And if we tell a lie, yun nga, Dr. Manal and Dr. Bos have been saying that a lot of our colleagues uh, got the illness because of uh, patients and their family members not telling the truth to us. Okay, so what else? Next would be the role of palliative care in providing support for emotional distress. So again, I just like to reiterate what Dr. Manalo said, the importance of an interdisciplinary or multidisciplinary teams. There's a plan and you have to integrate triads decisions for appropriate referrals when patients need to be referred to palliative care. And our goal is really to ensure and provide comfort care. Now that um, it's very hard to do all the face-to-face -face, uh, interactions, we really have to adapt to the new normal where things uh, can be made digitally. So we, we have to try our best to adapt to that, even if we're not really techy. Uh, it's only it's the only way right now where we can really reach our patients and their families as well. So, um, in our institution, um, before that, so in terms of uh, making sense of distress, like what Dr. Rabausa mentioned about dissonance. So you can see from this um, graph that our patients who are ill have a lot of, uh, what do you call this, um, emotions that we need to address. These are our patients on the ill side. And we have to also address our health workers at the same times where we are the ones reacting to what's happening around us. So these things need to be addressed in a form of multidisciplinary approach where your team members can help you address their anxieties, their fears, diba? because we cannot do everything. So in, in our institution, we have a group processing where our employees can be sent uh, to uh, counseling via online by our psych department and even patients right now remember that the uh, have already opened telecommunication to public and uh, making us accessible via via telecommunication so it will not stop us from reaching out to our patients in this uh, covid times okay what are other social concerns that we have seen? These are um, under universal health care. You know that the government has already provided many health services for free through PhilHealth. So I'm not sure about the other hospitals, but in our institution, um, not, all, not all expenses have been covered by PhilHealth. <laughs> Hospital has been the rest of it, but much of the healthcare cost is really from.
your families need more support, then we can refer them to social services or other LGUs uh, that can uh, uh, add to their uh, financial burden. No? So depends on the locality. Benefits and aids may be provided. We just have to help our patients and their families um, tap the right resources. Okay, what else? And then I have cases um, where patients and their families have fear of going home. Not the COVID patients, uh, but the, the patients who are chronically ill who wants to go home and will have some stigma in their community. So what we do is we really give out the medical certificates that they're COVID free. And then we um, coordinate with the LGU uh, for transfer of these patients from hospital to community that they're cleared from COVID or they're not infectious at all. And other forms, someone when they're COVID and in cases where the patient dies at home, we coordinate them with LGU or the municipal health officers and barangay officials. They have all the protocols on how these legal documents are issued. So it's really about uh, communicating things and try to tap the right people to make our patients and their families um, less worry about things that we can help them on, okay? So those are some of the social concerns that we looked into. And the next would be spiritual and religious aspects. So this one, spiritual care addresses really how people make meaning of the word world in their place in it. But for COVID patients, when they think about death, um, it is the ultimate moment in their lives. So when dying is predominantly a medical issue, I think death is a purely spiritual issue that we need to address as well. Because when unmet spiritual needs arise, it results to feeling of hopelessness, loneliness, or sadness, especially when you're isolated. Remember when COVID patients are admitted, um, some hospitals would not allow uh, their loved ones to be with them. In turn, affects their self-care, motivation, and compliance to medications. And then, of course, it exacerbates the illness that caused those spiritual needs in the first place. Okay? So like in any other chronic illness, um, spiritual and religious um, concerns must be addressed for the patients. And intervening on the spiritual level can break that vicious cycle by connection between the patient, the patient's inner life, and the patient's outward manifestation of his illness, okay? Other concerns would be, you know, that most Filipino families have a strong faith in God and have specific beliefs in death and afterlife, so we have to really discuss these things with them in a holistic approach. Part of that would be really in your advanced care planning. And Normally, their local religious leaders or workers may visit them at home or in the hospital. But in some institutions, um, we do telecommunications, okay, and video conferences. A phone call may be also a best option. And then the pastors in the hospitals or chaplains are available for counseling or spiritual briefing. So despite the inability to physically cure the patient in palliative care, or COVID cases, attention to the issues associated with values and the meaning of life, also suffering and death become very important, including attention to physical suffering, mm -hmm. your, their psychological well-being and strengthening of relationships with self and with their significant or sacred. However, people understand that, which might include a relationship with God or another higher power. Okay. Next would be funeral arrangements. Okay, the current scenario requires special arrangements for burial or cremation of patients who die with confirmed COVID infections. So the families are advised to follow the national guidelines where they should be uh, cremated within 12 hours after death. And with the ECQ, you know that um, there are no, uh, what do you call this? The, uh, the there are a limited uh, number of family members who can attend to the deceased. 
whether it's uh, what they call the wake or diretso po sa cremation. So the funeral homes and churches have prepared arrangements for funeral rites because they they are lift they're lifted from the ECQ right. So they have skeletal forces. They can arrange the um, funeral arrangements for you. And with regards to um, what they call this uh, autopsy, um, autopsy is not allowed during the COVID times. What else? Oh, some general guidelines that you can look into the um, DOH website regarding um, funerals. So they are all handled the same way. So subs suspects or probable COVID, um, they should be handled the same way with safety precautions. And burial and cremations are safe as long as there's infection and preventive control where you do PPE and of course, after using that, you remove them after handing bodies and discard them appropriately. So, like what I've said, funeral services are granted exceptions from the ECQ. Embalming, not allowed, as well as the, uh, what they call this, the, and the wakes will not be allowed. Okay, I'm not sure long when they lifted the MECQ, but still it's a gathering. So, I believe it's not yet allowed at this time. Okay, so you can look into the guidelines I placed in the slide uh, for the point by point where your patients would ask regarding some specific details in terms of uh, funeral services. Okay, I cannot see if there are questions, sorry. I will end my slide, but if you have questions, just please feel free to ask me because I think this is my last slide. I've discussed funeral arrangements, spiritual and religious aspects, and legal and some social concerns. Do you have questions? Okay, Joey, thank you, Joey. But I have to, before ending it, I'd like to share you some. Yes. Go ahead, Joey. Yeah, so I came across this poem that I'd like to share with you. So we all woke up one day and everything was new. A shift in normal living that affected me and you. We take so much for granted until it's stripped away. Then we start searching for ways to make it through each day. Attitude is key, you know, it takes a strong one to get by. Positivity and optimism will keep you soaring high. We need to change our focus to cope and persevere, to help keep smiling faces and eliminate the fear. Throughout the world, we're different but we're now sisters and brothers, finally united and looking out for one another. So how do we get through this? I was afraid you might ask, through intense soul searching, making goals and setting tasks. Sit quietly for a moment and relax your mind. Listen to your inner voices. You'll be amazed at what you'll find. Ideas will flow immensely and occupy the space. You might manifest what you want and things will fall into place. Reflect on what has been, then let it go, cause it's the past. If you were wounded, put a band-aid on. If you were broken, use a cast. We have so much to be thankful for, more than we realized. Pause for a minute, take a deep breath, and open up your eyes. Look at the people out there on the front line every day. It's so amazing what they do, how they help to make a way. We have food to eat. We have medical care, we wake up each day, we have clothes to wear. We have ways to communicate with our families and friends, clear the air with someone, take time to make amends, learn something new, aspire to do better, read a book, accept a challenge, sit down and write a letter. The options are limitless on what you can achieve. It just takes a little effort and for you to believe. It's all in our way of thinking and we can wake up each day with a smile. After counting our many blessings and come terms to with our new lifestyle, we've been given an opportunity that we've never had before. Time, a precious gift here today, but maybe no more. Your mindset should have changed by now seeing where we are today. What we once knew as normal is different now, you say. It is what it is, no need to cry and moan. The impact is worldwide, so you are not alone. So this was done by Naila Chalon of uh, Palliative Care Network. Oh, that's uh, my last slide. Thank you. 
Thank you so much, Joey. That was a very beautiful way and very uh, reflective way you know, to end um, our talks this evening. And um, the questions have um, already come in and uh, maybe we can um, answer a few uh, while our speakers are still here. Not sure if Dr. Amanalo is here, but um, the first question um, we'd like to ans ask our speakers is about uh, DNR and DNI. The question is, um, is in your institution for COVID cases specifically, is DNR and DNI packaged together um, such that the decision of DNI without, but with CPR is not an option? Um, maybe we can ask Dr. Bausa uh, first, how, how is it in your hospital now? Or if Dr. Joey would like to share. Is DNR, DNI uh, one form um, or are they separate uh, decisions given uh, COVID cases for COVID mm -hmm. cases? Uh, Joey, would you like to answer first? Sure, Doctora. Um, it's actually not packaged together, but it's explained together, right? So the purpose of giving advance directives or asking for direct advance directives would be respecting what the patient and the family's preferences. So um, if one is not signed, we would respect. Um, and then, of course, when we see there's, fit, uh, there's really no point in doing the other one, our role is to help explain to the family and of course, not the patient anymore, right? No, the family of uh, the need for signing and the need for not um, prolonging suffering. So it's not a perfect thing, but um, we as specialists uh, would have that skill to be able to make our families understand that we have to proceed with the DNR, DNI rather than one alone because the vicious cycle will be there the quality of life will not be there if one will not be signed. In, in this case, uh, if this patient is dying. So uh, that's how I see it because I haven't had a case. But for our institution, you know, it's, it's not together. But we try to make our patients, I, their families understand why they have to make that kind of decision. Um, I hope I was able to answer your question. Dr. Abausa? Uh -oh. Yes, I uh, basically you know, in a government hospital, uh, JBL and Amang, and also in Medical City and also PGH. So both government and private hospitals, we always explain to the family that DNR, DNI do not resuscitate and do not intubate uh, means that there will be no aggressive measures that will be done. If they pick one, do not resuscitate, but may still do intubation, we explain that it's not going to be uh, effective you know, because one goes hand in hand with the other one, you know, in intubation and resuscitation. And part of aggressive measures and heroic measures is intubation and resuscitation. So magkasama yun. So pagka hindi magkaiba ang choice, no? Uh, some family or some patients would want, no? okay, CPR nyo ako, but no intubation. At the end, no, there will come a time, there will be a painful discussion with the family because the patient cannot answer anymore. So we meet the family and we are the ones that always uh, discussing and uh, emphasizing to them na hindi na dapat gawin because it doesn't help the patient and it doesn't improve the outcome. So it's a painful discussion. So at the very start, we have to explain to the family that DNI and DNI goes hand in hand. So hindi pwedeng isa or um, isa lang ang pipiliin. So let's avoid uh, having those uh, painful discussion by... Um, emphasizing it at the very start when we do advance directive uh, discussion or if we ask the family to sign the form. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Joey. Maybe just to answer this one last question about 
How do you facilitate communication or video calls between terminal COVID patients and their families? Um, I will just share that uh, the one of our patients, um, they have their own phones. Some of them have their own phones left in the room. Um, and this is one way for the families to call um, them um, regularly. But if they are in the, uh, the, the terminal phase of illness and they cannot reply. We counsel also the family that they can still express um, their, their love and their, their care. Uh, they can still send messages through videos or actual phone calls and the bedside nurse would put the phone um, next to the, the ears of the patient in order for them to hear uh, the messages of, of their, their loved one even if they cannot reply. But this would come with um, initial counseling and, and orienting you know, the family as to how to, to speak and what to say. So this can really be made possible, um, especially through the availability of technology. And we are seeing more hospitals optimizing this now. iPads, phones, connecting them with, with family and even with spiritual care providers. Prayers can be said over the phone. And um, this is being done now in several of our hospital settings. Okay, so I know it's uh, one minute to seven. We've been here for the past uh, two hours. Um, and, um, but we really appreciate all those who have um, joined us this evening. Um, we will continue, you know, we have part three. And again, this is a um, continuing endeavor wherein these webinars will be offered um, in another run. So for the first run, it will be the first three guidance. And then uh, we will look forward to the second run of the three documents and webinars. Uh, after also that um, you have also given feedback, which we greatly appreciate after this. So um, if we may also just um, uh, invite you to, to visit uh, the Facebook group of palliative collab, wherein your your uh, your questions could also be addressed. Uh, aside from also going to the Facebook page of um, the PSPHP and and the Society also of Palliative uh, Medicine and Hospice Philippines. So you have four Facebook pages that you can actually visit now and uh, share your questions to. Um, so we would like to ask everyone to turn on their videos before we say goodbye so that we can have a photo. Uh, I am seeing now 89 um, participants. Um, so if we can ask everyone to turn on their videos. Thank you very much. We hope to uh, have a repeat No, the webinar of Dr. Manalo. Um, it's very interesting. It's just the audio uh, failed us a bit, so we will for sure have another run of this. All right. Okay, for Dr. Lester. Have a good photo. Hello. No. can you take Hello. our photo? Thank you. Hi. Hello. Good evening, everyone. So for photo, ready. One, two, three. Another one. One, two, three. Another one for one, two, three. And last one. One, two, three. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you to everyone. Thank you to our speaker, Dr. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Paul. Thank you. Thank you also. Thanks, May. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am.